So it's going to, to be a new start. And now we are with the bank with the balance sheet of a bank, and that balance sheet of a bank exhibits well. If we stick to the definition of what a, a bank is doing, the bank is receiving, the, accepting deposits, and providing loans. Hence, the most sim the simplest form of a bank balance sheet is loans on the one on, on the asset side, deposit on the liability side. The income provides the income uh, comes from the from the interest on loans, and the costs. Is, is related to the way deposits are uh, uh, collected because, well, basically you need to have either a physical network or at least advertisement or something that, that has some cost, okay? Um, well, this being said, as you can imagine, the, 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 main, the main business of the bank is transforming both the maturity and risk from the from the liability side into the into the asset side. What, what what do we mean by transforming maturity and risk? We simply mean that, you know, deposits are not term deposits. Of course, the the, the, the customer they put some money in on their on their account and then they can withdraw at any moment. While when you lend some money, you lend it to a mat, to a term to a maturity which is very different from from the short term. Of the, of the deposit themselves. So what the bank do, does is that it transforms short-term, very short-term deposits into long-term loans. And on the other hand, deposits, of course, are not risky at all because it's money that you do have. Well, there might be a little risk when, for instance, a customer brings you a check and you accept to cash the check before the compensation operation has been done. So, you know, this, this may happen because usually well, a bank can take up to a week to, uh, to, to credit your account with the amount of a check. So if you're a good customer, they can do this in advance. So they take some risk in doing so. But basically the risk is more on the asset side because there is more risk when you lend to someone and that someone does not pay in the end, doesn't pay back. Hence, the, the risk is not the same and the risk and the maturity are not the same on the liabilities and the asset side. Okay. Yeah. How do they manage for a short term, like for the short term deposits and the long term loans? For example, if someone comes, there's a lot of people coming for uh, to withdraw to withdraw their deposits. Is they already like long term? That, that's all. That's all the point with the banking business. So we're going to do this slowly. <laughs> okay. Because because first, what what I should say is that when we give this definition of bank. We have the idea that banks are doing only this. In fact, they are not. And, and, and the reason why I should insist on this is that first, they are, they are competing for on some other business lines on the one hand, and they do have some other competition. And as you, as you probably know, since the beginning of the financial crisis, well, not exactly since the beginning of the financial crisis, but well, since at least 2012, since the generalization of quantitative easing in, in all developed countries, uh, banks are not exactly doing the same job because they can, they can lend almost infinite amounts of cash from the central banks. Hence, basically, they, they, they no longer have that maturity problem. Uh, they still have the risk problem, but, but not, well, at least they, they don't have the liquidity problem. But that's, that's why I think we should look a bit uh, in the mirror to get the picture of what it was before that, that time. But let's, let's go a bit slowly. Uh, so this is, this is the core of the banking business, and I mean, this is what we will concentrate, focus on, okay? But we know that actual banks may provide a wider range of liquidity services, okay? Of financial services in general, but not all banks provide the same financial services. There are those, you know, um, some banks do provide extremely uh, high-tech uh, financial, financial advice or, you know, those uh, corporate and investment banks, they do provide some services which are not provided by smaller, smaller banks. But almost all banks do provide a range of liquidity services. That's what I want to say. Because, for instance, every bank um, provides you some means of payment so that you can use the cash which is on your banking account. Well, in the 19th century, it was, it was quite, or, or even in the, the first half of the 20th century, or even until the 1970s in France, 
it was quite obvious that bank was almost like a safe, a place where you put your money, but you cannot expand it easily. But right now, it seems quite obvious that a bank should provide you with a means of payment. Especially in France, because if, if you look, for instance, at the US, in the US there are far more, far more companies providing means of payment than banks. I mean, there are companies providing means of payments which are very different from banks. For instance, credit cards company in the US, they are distinct from banks. While in France, the Groupe en Carte Bancaire is in fact owned by the banks themselves and operated by the banks themselves. So in France, the payment system is really an integral part of the, of the business of actual banks. But still, what defines a bank from a legal point of view is not the operation of the payment system. It is the provision of, of, of uh, loans on the one hand and uh, you know, the, the collection of deposits on the other hand. Um, hence, in fact, pure banks, banks who are doing only deposits and lending, do not exist. And so when we'll be talking about banks, in fact, there, are, there is a portfolio of activities. And, and there are many business lines. And the reason why there are many business lines is, of course, that those are profitable. But still, uh, the question of providing the economy with credit is, is the question at hand when we talk about you know, the, mo the model of those agents which are supposed to provide loans. Okay? So, when we think about banks, we, we don't just think about um, one actual bank, but also about how should this function of providing credit to the economy be performed. So we are looking at it from the, the point of view of how it is done right now, but maybe at some point we, we will ask whether it, it could be done more efficiently in, in some other way. Um, now, if, if, we, if we look with a bit more detail, at the bank's balance sheet, in fact, things are a bit more complex, as, as I, I've been telling you. Uh, for instance, if we look at the liabilities, there are the deposits, but as with any company, there, there is some capital, okay, some equity. And of course, the value of the equity is the difference between the value of the asset side and the value of the other liabilities. And those other liabilities are interbank uh, liabilities, which almost no longer exists since the financial crisis. And in this respect, lending by the central bank replaced those interbank liabilities, which amounted to 25% of the bank balance sheet before the crisis. Okay. But right now it's, well, I should not say it doesn't, it, don't, it, do, it does no longer exist, but it does not feature, it, it does not provide any more liquidity. No. You cannot rely on interbank uh, lending as, as a mean of providing liquidity at the moment. There are still stocks uh, of, of interbank liabilities in, in bank balance sheets, but the, the, the net flows are zero. Um, and by wholesale funding, we mean... What, what means wholesale funding? You give me wholesale funding. I have a plan for the weekend, but I need some wholesale funding. Well, it's basically when you go to the market and, and you, you, you issue securities, okay? The idea with wholesale is that you design a security which, which has to be marketed in large quantities, okay? While there are also other debts, other debts, and those other debts are... Uh, well, instruments which are not wholesale, but because, for instance, there, there can be swap instruments, for instance, okay? And, and some other things. So. Um, on the liability side, mm. you can find different, different way of financing your, your bank. Uh, and while on the asset side, uh, the point is that you're not just providing loans. Well, you need some physical capital. We've, we've been telling that you need buildings, okay? Or uh, servers, uh, in case of a new bank or an new bank. But as well, you're your values can be, can be invested in, in securities or in other, uh, in interbank assets, basically. It means you can lend to other banks. Or you can also store some money um, and, and hence have cash reserves with the, with the central bank, simply because you need to provide liquidity to your customers using, for instance, ATM, okay, automated teller machines. Hence, you need to have some cash. 
for this for this service, but also for the, the everyday compensation. Okay, because every every day you may expend some some money to other uh, banks, and this is compensated. This is settled, netted by by the compensation system, and ultimately the. The, the difference is paid using a central money. Okay. Um, so when we look at the bank balance sheet, there are different qualities of liabilities, which are ways of finding funds, and different quality of assets. Uh, the reason uh, why there are such different qualities of assets and liabilities is to be found in. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm just looking for the next slide. That's it. Okay. The idea is simply that, in fact, not all assets provide the same yield. Okay, so, so in fact, assets um, differ by by the yield that they provide. Of course, the risk they carry, and the type of liquidity uh, the, you experience when you hold them. And of course, the idea of the banks is simply to try to minimize to maximize your profits by by choosing a portfolio of assets which give you maximum return for a given le for the level of risk you, you, you decided to accept. So you can think of bank management, of management of banking assets as you know, uh, managing a portfolio exactly in the same way as, well, you have been studying pro portfolio theory. Is it something that appeals to your mind, portfolio theory? No? Ah. Okay, so you should be doing this in financial markets, maybe. Okay, but just imagine that every, every category of asset is defined by, an, by a return, which is a random variable. Then there might be some way of selecting a, you know, a, a portfolio of assets, which will give you the best return for a given level of risk, okay? or which would minimize the level of risk for a given return. And this will give you the, the mix you want to, the asset mix you want to have with your, with your bank. Okay. So, uh, there are reasons to, uh, to invest in different assets, and on the other hand, of course, there are also reasons to diversify your sources of funding, simply because if you can find a way to profitably use your, invest your capital, then, then you're making money. And then we see that we are going even farther away from the definition we gave of a bank, because we have said the principle with a bank is that you get deposit on the one hand and then you lend the money on the other hand. And what we see is that there are other ways of procuring money and there are other, other ways of investing money. Basically, if, if you invest at a rate which is higher than the cost of the money, you're earning money. Well, at some point, there must be some risk consideration, but if, if you can access if you can tap large source of funds, then there seems to be no reason to stop expanding your, your balance sheet. Okay. Um, and and um, well, but what we see with this is that the, the the issues that we have identified when the balance sheet was very simple are still in force because. Maturity transformation is even more obvious when you see this complex balance sheet than when the balance sheet was only with deposits and, and loans. Because there is no reason why the, the, you know, the, the liability side could be matched with the asset side. Okay. And, and risk, risk transformation as well, is, is, there is no reason why the liability side uh, should have the same amount of risk as the as the asset side. And, and because, of course, you know that the more risky the asset you invest in, the more return you should get. Okay? So, so of course, um, banks are tempted to, to invest into riskier assets in order to get a higher return. And in this respect, there, there might be an agency problem, for instance. It's, it's only a parenthesis. But if you, think, if you think of managers whose tenure with the bank is only the uh, of you know, some years, the point is that their decision horizon should, is, is short in comparison with the, the decision horizon of the, of the shareholders, for instance. 
Um, so the managers of the bank could be tempted to take decisions which favor a short-term return. And they could e ignore a medium-term risk. Okay. So there is no reason. In fact, we have good reasons to understand why the level of risk is not the same on, on, on every side of the balance sheet and one risk why risk should be monitored. And what we see also is that since banks are financed by debt, and since bankers are good at finding investments which have a higher return than the cost of capital, banks should be very leveraged because your clever bank management means borrowing, 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 and investing, 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 as long as the rate you can get from the money is above the rate that costs. Okay, so, so there seems to be no limit to the expansion of the balance sheet. Um, hence, banks should have a, a very high leverage, that is to say a very low asset uh, or capital in comparison with the value of the whole balance sheet. Well, eventually, I should make a little parenthesis just to say that part of banking in income is, is provided or derived from fees. Okay. Fees either because you provide advice services or uh, payment services or whatever, or because, in fact, banks do not just uh, lend money and get, get interest payment every year. It is quite clear that since the 1960s, the American bank, they have been originating and distributing. Okay, that is to say, they grant credit and then they securitize the credit so that they get it out of their balance sheet so that it doesn't consume or it doesn't need, require any more capital and they can lend the new. So this, this, this is typically the case on the American market. It did not come to the European market before uh, very recently, but it's the trend on the European market as well. Okay. So you, you shall not see the balance sheet as something which is completely static and which can only increase because the banks are lending ever more. In fact, the balance sheet can be very dynamical, even if it's a balance sheet. Okay. So the balance sheet supposedly is, an, is a photograph of what the bank owns. But what the bank owns could change, not just because the bank grants new credits, okay, but also because the bank can sell assets, even assets which are usually not marketable, such as loans which have been provided before. You, you, you all know that the subprime crisis was caused by banks selling the loans which they provide, well, in fact, which they did not provide, but which were provided to um, those ninjas, okay, no income, no job, no asset. Well, uh, subprime households which are, were not able to, to pay back their debt. So this technique, uh, the role of the bank, of the American banks in, in, in this respect was not to, to grant the credits, because the credits were granted by, mostly by, um, by brokers, okay? But the, the role of the banks was to group together all the, those credits and, as you know, securitize them into structured vehicles and release the um, the securities which were backed by those loans on the market in order to get some funds and then uh, finance new acquisition of debt, etc. Okay, so, but this is impure banking in our respect. But the reason, the reason I gave that definition, which is the legal definition, is of course that this definition is the definition of a function in the economy, which is providing credit to the economy. Okay, when you look at banks, at real banks, you understand that they do many things. But what should be our concern is how you provide credit to the economy. Even if banks are much more complex than just providing money to the economy. So the point here is simply to try to understand how a bank actually works. And then you can ask whether this function should be provided more efficiently by someone else. Okay. So maybe, maybe the next question is to or the, the next point is to, to make clear the differences that do exist between banks and other financial institutions, such as, for instance, mutual funds. Mutual funds, it's a completely American concept, but we do have mutual funds as well, it's French law, in French law, which we would call, call OPCVM, okay, des Organismes de Placement Collectif en Valeur Mobilière, 
On va, donc on va avoir des fonds communs de placement et des soucis d'investissement à capital variable. But those are basically the French, uh, the French flavor for mutual fund. And what, what means a mutual fund? Mutual fund means uh, you don't have enough money to diversify. You don't have enough money to hold a diversified portfolio of financial assets. So you invest into a larger portfolio from which you hold just a share. And that's the definition of a mutual, of a mutual fund. So th there is a, ma a fund manager who runs the fund, and the fund has a style. The, so you know more or less what's in the fund, and you decide to, in to invest into that fund because you, you think this is the strategy you, you want to, uh, to have for your investments. So you can be completely passive and go with passive funds or even with trackers, or you can, you can go for an active management of your, or your fund, or you can go for a different sector or whatever. But the point is simply that you own only a part of a larger fund which is managed either passively, which means it only reproduces the, composi the, the, the way the, the stock market index is done, or uh, an active management. This is your choice, but the point is simply that it's we're talking about a mutual fund, that is to say, a fund which has an asset which can be composed of financial securities or securitized loans. We just told about the subprime market, but the subprime crisis. Of course, the, the, you know, the trigger of the subprime crisis was the release on the market of those uh, funds which were invested entirely into, into loans uh, granted to ninjas. Okay? Or there could be whatever, in fact, because you, you can think of, for instance, the sukuk. You know, the sukuk is a financial instrument in, in Islamic finance. You can think of the sukuk as a mutual fund, and the sukuk usually is the securitization of uh, physical assets. Okay, so basically, the mutual fund is a vehicle where you put whatever asset you want, and then what you do is that you sell securities which do represent part of the fund, okay, and hence part of the assets which are securitized in the fund. The, the, the point is simply that the, the value of the fund is, is the, the value of the assets which you do part in the fund. And the, the liability side is in fact constituted by the securities which you do issue to those who invest in, in the fund. But the, the value of those shares is exactly the value of the asset. Everything is completely transparent. Okay. Well, at least if, if the asset is listed on a, on, a, on a market, it's quite easy to value the asset. If the asset is not listed, asset valuation can be a bit more tricky. But basically, the idea is, the, is that the value of the, of the liability side is exactly the same as the value of the asset side. And in fact, the, the liabilities only represent the asset side. So in this respect, there is no maturity transformation, no risk transformation, no deposit, no leverage. There, there are only, you know, uh, shares which are issued which represent the asset, and that's all. So, yeah. What do we consider deposits as assets? Um, right. Because you can, um, for instance, uh, a mutual fund can, can own some cash with a bank. Uh, be, because, you know, uh, when, when, when a new customer buys a, a new share, which is the case with, we call, we call the mutual fund CICAV in France because they are Société d'Investissement Capital Variable. That is to say, so far, the, 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 you know, the, the overall, the, the asset side is worth 1 billion, and then you come with 100 million, you invest 100 million. So that the liability side raises by 100 million, which is owed to you. The asset side increases by 100 million in cash, which is put in deposit with the bank before it is invested in something else. But then, once, for instance, if some, some shares are sold, they are sold for cash and maybe not reinvested immediately. So, of course, that cash is held as deposits. But there can be also term deposits in money market funds because you can, you can have term deposits with banks, which in the past, I mean, where there was an interest rate, a non zero interest rate. Term deposits could, could uh, you know, benefit from an interest. At the moment, as you can borrow at zero from the central bank, term deposit makes no sense. 
Um, so my point is simply that mutual funds are transparent and they provide no transformation at all. So they are completely different from banks. So you don't have a, a think, you don't have to think of banks as, as large mutual funds. We've said, okay, the asset side of a bank is a portfolio, that's it. But the liability side is, is not at all a, a, a mere reflection of the asset side. Because the shareholders of the banks, they own them. That's something, but then there are many, many uh, creditors who provided capital through different schemes, etc. So, so this means maturity and risk transformation. And, and what shall we say from a neo bank? Uh, maybe you should ask what, what a neo bank is. We, we just documented two examples: Boursorama on the one hand, and and uh, Revolut on the other hand. Um, well. If we, look, if we look at Revolut, the, the basic service provided by Revolut is in fact a payment service in many, many currencies without fees. Because if you, if you want to pay uh, with your uh, credit card or if you want to transfer money to a different country, it will cost you a lot. By a lot, I mean it depends. It, it's far less than when you want to transfer cash through uh, MoneyGram or uh, or uh, whatever, but it's, it's still, still quite expensive. The point with Revolut is that, that transfers are far less expensive. And that was, that was the, the, you know, the, the starting product of Revolut. But, uh, but in fact, Revolut is not just about uh, providing transfer services. Now, why, why are transfer services important? Look, for instance, if, if you go to uh, even Italy for, a, for a, an Erasmus exchange program for, for next term, of course, you will, for instance, you will receive the grants from the university every month on your bank account in France, but if, in case you want to withdraw some money from the ATM in Italy, you, it will cost you a fee. In case you want to, to pay the university by a wire transfer from France to Italy, it will cost you some fees, etc. So, well, but maybe, maybe since, since Italy is in the European Union, maybe those fees might be reasonable. But if you go to Switzerland, for instance, or, or Britain, which is no longer part of the European Union, as you know, then the fees will, will rocket. And, and, well, my memory is that when my daughter went to London, uh, she went, you know, every month, she could withdraw money three times from the ATM without charge. But then, the, the fourth time, it was three pounds or so. And, and every, uh, transfer, every operation, financial operation was quite expensive. So she turned to Revolut and everything is free. That's it. That's as simple as this. Um, so maybe you, you, you think that Revolut is only a payment service company. But when you look at the, at the detail, it's no longer the case. Okay? We are doing many things, and we are doing them well. Uh, in fact, the, the, the boss of Revolut, whose name is Tronsky, uh, this interview is just saying that uh, they intend to become the Amazon of financial services. Okay. So, of course, most people come to Revolut in order to get the, payments, the free payment service, but then they discover that uh, when well, the company started out with pre prepaid currency card, uh, today's feature set is simply encyclopedic, okay, current, current accounts, Crypto trading, travel insurance, home insurance, euro direct debits, business accounts, airport lounge access, whatever, concierge service, high street discounts, etc. Um, so the idea with, uh, with Revolut is not just to be strong on one market segment, it's to provide a full scope of financial services and, in fact, to provide them at, at uh, bargain basement price in order to attract people, and to hence to find uh, a profitable business model which is costless for the customer, okay? Um, so, 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 um, so the, the idea is that when we look at new banks, the same applies as with bank. We're looking at companies that do have many, many, many different activities, okay? We think of, of uh, Boursorama as being a website and a place where you can store your money, but in fact, they probably do things I have no idea of. And so they somewhat mimic banks by offering many financial services. 
So are they really different from banks? I hope there are no leak in the ceiling. Uh, so the question is whether Revolut is a bank, because it, it seems to mimic a bank by expanding into many activities. Is it a bank? Is it a bank? Um, well, we'll see by looking at the balance sheet. Because we have said balance sheet of banks is quite simple to understand. There are deposits on the one hand, and, uh, and there are loans on the other hand. So when we look at, at, the, at the, the asset side, because this is the asset side of Revolut, I, I'm, I know, I'm sorry, it's, it's quite small, but what you see is that, I know, it's, it's asset and liabilities. So if we look at, at the asset side, the total asset uh, in two th for the fiscal year uh, 2017 were 55 million, okay? And from this, the current assets were 54 million. That is to say, there is practic practically no asset outside of the, of the current assets, okay? So basically, Revolut is not providing loads. They, they only have rolling stock, and that's it. And when you look at the liabilities, ah, they, have all, they have almost no liabilities. But what they do have, just as they, just as they do have current assets, they do have current liabilities, but of course no deposits. But still, people deposit money with them. How do they manage not to have deposits? Um, the point is that what, what they do have, their current liabilities, are really low, simply because, because what, what people do is that, in fact, they they use Revolut simply as a, as a means of transfer. So they leave only very few uh, money with Revolut. The, the point is, and hence, the business model of Revolut is, well, actually, I don't know. I didn't look into the, into the figures. But the question is, how can you earn money by taking no charges? I guess the point is that at some point, you must take charges, take fees but lower than the competition, and be a bit more clever in where you get the fees from, okay? But when, when we ask the question, is Revolut the bank, the point, the point is simply that there, is, there are no loans, there are no long-term investment at all. They only have current assets. So this is not a bank, okay? And since most assets are current assets, there is no maturity transformation. There is no risk transformation either, because it seems that risk is growing with maturity. Of course, you, you can hold very risky short-term assets, but usually <laughs> that's not really legal. Okay? So when we think of risk, risk is somewhat correlated with, with uh, maturity. Um, well, and since there are no risks on, on the asset side of the balance sheet, there is no need for, for capital to absorb credit loss. Revolut doesn't create money. Okay, but this is not the core of, of, of banking activity. I'm talking about something different, yeah, but the point is still the same. You know, we, identify, we, we decided that the core business of the bank was to take deposits and grant loans, but what we see is that there are things coming with taking deposits and granting loans, and those things coming are not just payment services, but also usually banks do have capital in order to absorb credit losses, we'll see how, and this is not what Revolut has. So, um, but Revolut provides some credit to its customer, but not directly, okay? Basically, what you can do is, uh, via Revolut, go to a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform that will lend you some money which will be received on your Revolut account and which you can then transfer without fee to another platform. So there, the business model is simply that the peer-to-peer -peer lending platform will pay to Revolut a fee. And so, of course, you do pay Revolut indirectly, but not by paying for the transfer of money. Okay. So when we call Revolut a neo-bank, in fact, it seems it has nothing to do with the bank. Albeit, it performs some payment service as bank do. Albeit, it has some features of a bank, but still, it's not a bank. Okay. So neo-banks are no banks. And by the way, how would you do to, to, okay, to, to obtain a credit from Revolut in order to buy a flat, for instance, since they have no branches? Where, where to go to get the, the credit? Where, where to go to find the advisor? 
So, so they, are, they are not providing banking services, albeit they took a banking license from Lithuania. That is to say, they are probably going to expand into the banking business. But doing so, they will probably do it with a peculiar bank, peculiar business model, which is interesting to follow. But at the moment, I have no idea of how they are going to optimize the traditional business model of banks. Okay. So, neo banks are not banks. Uh, could we say, or should we say, that peer to peer lending platforms are banks? Uh, if you're interested in peer to peer banking platforms, you, usually that course was, was uh, given by uh, Olena Avrinci, but she's on leave for this term. Uh, still, uh, you can click the link and see the video she realized she, she shot, in fact, to explain what a, a peer to peer lending platform is. The very interesting thing is that. She, she did this in, in, in cooperation with a student two years ago, because we had a student who was making some, you know, uh, graphic design for, for video. So uh, it's, it, it was produced in-house, and it's still far better than what I could do. But here, my, my point is simply not just to allude to, uh, to Olina's work, but to explore quickly what, what a, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, platform is, since we just documented one with, with the way um, uh, Revolut was using one. Uh, well, a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform is basically a platform, just as like Uber or whatever, which puts in contact uh, suppliers on the one hand and, and demanders on the other hand. But in this case, we think about suppliers and, and, and demand of, of money, okay? of, uh, of liquidity. And as you, as you all know, okay, peer-to-peer lending platforms do not own um, the, the credits in their own balance sheet. What they do is that they put in contact the lender with the, with the borrower and those sign a contract, a bilateral contract, and what the platform does is that it, takes, it does take a fee, but it has nothing to do with the, with the life of the loan itself. So no loan on the balance sheet. So the balance sheet should be the same as Revolut. And we have then a fine, uh, fine provider of financial services, which, by the way, is regulated in France by the APCR, that is to say the same regulator as banks, but it's not providing any services. So oh, yeah. How is it that how the or the new banks are different from like Western Union that is famous because it's one of the biggest yeah, but, but in like, international payments? The, the point with Western Union is that they are known for providing uh, cash transfer. This, this is their main business. Okay? And cash transfer is especially useful in countries where the, the banking system does not provide sophisticated uh, means of payment. So the cash payments are used uh, either by uh, criminals, because, because of course, as you probably know, uh, uh, cash is the best way not to be traced. But this is, well, we'll talk about this later. Or by, by uh, people who do not live in their own country, especially migrants, and, and people working abroad who send money to their family, what we call remittances. But can, money transfer is especially used for, for remittances. Okay? Um, in order to fight the criminal use of cash transfer, there have been many regulations against uh, money laundering. And of course, the, you know, the, the compliance with those regulations is quite costly for the uh, money uh, transfer companies, hence the cost of money transfer, because you have to perform these compliance operations. Um, money, um, companies such as MoneyGram and, and uh, Western Union, they also provide uh, services, payments, well, transfer services for electronic money, for instance, at a far lower cost, because if the money comes from the bank and goes to another bank, then it's, it's far easier to do the compliance uh, paperwork because it, it's supposed, it has supposedly been done by the banks themselves. So, the, uh, in fact, Revolut is only in competition with this, this uh, later service. But, I, I shall not say this too loud, in my opinion, Western Union and MoneyGram are not very competitive on, on this kind of transfers, simply because they benefit from a complementary key effect. They are, they, are, they, are, they are not mon monopolers uh, 
in, 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 in uh, cash transfer because uh, there are two of them, okay, MoneyGram and, and Western Union. And there may be some others, but I mean, it's, it's an oligopoly. Um, it's an oligopoly, and those who work in this oligopoly, they provide some other services, but they are not the, the best at providing those services because basically, customers who are accustomed to send money via money transfer, sometime when they need some other, other transfer means, they, they still go to, to uh, Western Union, albeit Western Union is not the best. While if you look for the best service, you would probably go for Revolut. That, that's why I, I, was, I was saying that probably Revolut is smarter than the banks in its pricing of services because, you know, it's just like a supermarket. The supermarket cannot not sell every product uh, at the lowest price in the city. And the supermarket must find a price mix which is such that it will attract customers but make profit. And Revolut is probably doing the same. So for Western Union, etc., they provide the best service uh, in, in cash transfer, but probably not the less expensive uh, in, in the payment service. Well, Revolut attracts people with lower uh, payment service at a lower cost. And, of course, those lower costs should be... Uh, the money should, should be taken from somewhere else. So do you think that Western Union like, takes advantage of the lack of financial structures in many countries? Yes, so of course. Cash transfers, yes, of cash course. transfers are like, yes. far more important for people than using like, technology. Yeah, of course, this, this, is, this is one of the reasons why, why Western Union, for instance, was challenged by Bitcoin. Because in this, this country where, where the financial infrastructure is weak, uh, I mean, by financial infrastructure is weak, I mean, uh, I'm a Dominican and living in New York, which is the case of many Dominicans, okay? My family lives in, in uh, Republica Dominicana, and I'm sending in the money I'm, I'm earning every week. To them, I'm not sending to them via wire. I'm not sending it to them via, you know, a wire transfer on the banking account simply because my family doesn't have a banking account, or because the bank, there is no bank in the, in the village, or because, in fact, you can once you have a banking account, you must have a credit card. But the credit card is so expensive in, in Republica Dominicana that I don't see the point in having a credit card. So, I send the money. I send the money using wire transfer, and it's, it's ex expensive because it costs you maybe thirty dollars for a, for three hundred dollars. So it's almost ten percent. I think it's for, for small sums, it, it's between eight and ten percent. So at some point, you think it's better to buy some bitcoins, send the bitcoins to your younger brother, and then the younger brother can cash the bitcoins and get the money. Because it has two advantages. On the one hand, you learn your, your younger brother how to use bitcoins. And on the other hand, you don't have to pay for the, for the fee with Western Union. So the only risk there is that if the, Bitcoins, uh, if, if the Bitcoin volatility is higher than the transfer fee with Western Union, then you'll be worse off. But so, uh, they, this, the, the, the business model of Western Union is something else because, because in fact, they are operating on a very narrow niche. Because uh, as I've told, basically, they, they're uh, core market is remittances, and uh, when you fight crime, organized crime, hence cash payments, there is no way for them to expand. So they are on a dying niche, and they are not the core of the banking business. While Revolut might, might be a bit smarter and expanding. But when we think of peer-to-peer of, uh, -peer platforms, albeit they are regulated by the same regulator in France as the banks, they still are not bank, and they do not they, they, you know, I've told you that some banks, they do have the, the loans in their balance sheet and then they put them in vehicles to securitize them and get them out of their balance sheet. The point with the peer-to-peer -peer platform is that never do they have the, the loans in their own balance sheet. They're only intermediaries. They're put in contact, the lender and the borrower, and they, they say, oh, look, I've written the contract for you. All you have to do is sign there, sign there, but you'll be the only party to the contract. And I'm taking my fee, bye-bye. And you'll take the risks. So, so, in fact, they work exactly like... Well, when I say they work exactly like Revolut, I mean, their balance sheet is of the, of the same type. So there are no, no banks. Okay. Um, so another question is whether a stable coin is acting like a bank or a neo-bank or whatever bank. 
because a stable coin has to be issued as well. You know, maybe you're not familiar with the idea of stable coin, okay? But a stable coin is a virtual token. Uh, what is a virtual token? A virtual token is uh, an information in, in a database, and that's it. Okay, but think of a bit of, of Bitcoin. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is simply, well, it's something completely virtual because I cannot show you a, a Bitcoin. There, there's no, no, no place where Bitcoin are, except in the blockchain where it's written that at, on this address there are so many Bitcoins, and that's it. So it's an information in, in a database. And some people pay for this information, some would not. But the point with a stable coin is that supposedly it's valued on par with a given currency. Okay, so you can issue stable coins which are pegged to the dollar, and so one such stable coin should be worth one dollar. So ideally, the balance sheet of a stable coin is that you release tokens, and when you release tokens, you buy cash, so that for every token issued, there's one cash unit to back the token. I say ideally because at the moment, no stablecoin sh schemes operate this way. Um, I, I don't know what happened to, to Tether. Uh, Tether was the largest stablecoin uh, uh, scheme, uh, you know, in, in the, well, in, in the last few years. Uh, but in fact, and Tether said that every Tether they issued, which was supposedly worth one dollar, was backed with one dollar. When you see this, of course, you, you should ask, uh, where is the business model? Okay. Because if I take one dollar from you and I release to you something which is worth one dollar, I, I do have operating costs, but I don't have revenues. I don't have income. So uh, I, could, I could lend the cash. But at the moment, lending the cash, there's no revenue. So, um, so, 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 so Tether was clearly a fraud. Uh, therefore, I'm asking where they are at the moment. And I, I don't know. Um, but that's a good homework for next time. Maybe for me, but for you as well. But guess what? When we look at this, guess what? Guess what? Do we see risk transformation or maturity transformation? Of course not. You're taking cash, and uh, you're giving away tokens, but the tokens are supposed to be exactly the mirror image, digital image of cash. So there is no transformation at all, because you're, you're supposed to issue a, a digital asset, which is the exact equivalent of what you, you receive. No transformation. Well, there is some transformation, but Maybe there is some risk for those who own the tokens. But when we think of risk transformation, we mean in the bank, not outside, okay? not for the customer. So stablecoin is, is, does not have the, the same form as, as a bank. But in, fact, in, in, in fact, when we look at financial services providers, even the most modern, even those who say they, re, they look like banks, they, they want to be the banks of the future. Because, uh, as far as I'm concerned, in the last five years, I've heard many people telling me, oh, you know, Bitcoin is, go is gonna destroy the business model of the banks. Yeah, maybe. But uh, at the moment, Bitcoin has nothing to do with banks. Okay? Maybe it does provide a, a payment service, as, as, as we made it clear, and maybe it's a competitor to, uh, to lose providers of cash payment services, cash transfer services. It has nothing to do with providing credit to the economy. Um, especially if we look at this. Now, we could think that Bitcoin itself, uh, you know, the way it was uh, thought by Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, it's money creation and then it's a way of providing credit. Now, it's money creation, okay. So let's talk about money creation later. But now when we look at this, this balance sheet has nothing to do with the balance sheet of the bank, and there's nothing such as collecting deposits and, and releasing credit. So, so, so what? So in fact, the banking business is, is peculiar because it is the only one to provide credit by transforming deposits into, uh, into credit, okay? into loans. 
and, and it, it, is, it is quite fragile because of this activity of maturity and risk transformation. Because when you grant loans, you take risks. The risk being that you are not paid back. And since you still have a liability, the risk is that you cannot cover your liability. Okay? So banks, if we, for instance, think of, of insurance, as I told you yesterday, you know, with insurance, you take the premium. You got the cash. So there is no liquidity problem, at least if, if, if you correctly computed the premium. But there, with the bank, the point is that you grant the money, and you hope that you, you will be paid back, and sometimes it takes years or decades, and hence you're exposed to, uh, to risk. Hence, uh, you can become insolvent. Okay? So, risk transformation and high leverage means that banks only have little capital to absorb losses. We have told about high leverage because, as we have said, there seems to be no limit to the amount a bank can borrow in order to invest. Okay? If the bankers are clever, they can get money at a very low cost and they can find investments which, which offer a very high return. So, so in the end, they end up with very low, capi very low capital in comparison with the asset. And it's very high leverage. Well, they do take risk. So they seem to be prone to insolvency. And at the same time, so, so risk is, is more related to insolvency. Well, at the same time, maturity transformation could, is related not to insolvency itself, but to liquidity. Because you owe money to people who can ask, to, to, who can ask withdraw their money on site, while you lend money to uh, in illiquid investments. So, so there, there should be a liquidity risk. And if you think seriously of illiquidity, the problem with illiquidity is that it can even be self-fulfilling. Okay, if the customers think that the bank will become insolvent, they run to the window, they ask for their money, and of course the bank cannot give away all the, all the, 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 the money that was deposited in the accounts. So the, the metaphor of the self-fulfilling uh, bankruptcy of a bank is fascinating because the banking business is is really fragile to that kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, in fact, uh, if, if only banks were just providing loans, um, we should have no liquidity problems. Because if, if they were only providing loans, then people would not be interested in getting their money back. But the problem is that they are providing liquidity service. They're supposed to provide liquidity in general to the economy. Okay. Hence, they, they, they are supposed to provide liquidity out of illiquid uh, liability. That's crazy. Okay. Well, so because they are both fragile to liquidity risk and, and exposed to insolvency risk, banks are overly regulated and supervised and more than any financial institution. And this makes them quite special because, in fact, they do not operate in the same universe as we do. They do operate in a regulated universe where everything is distorted by regulation. Um, so when we talk about banks, we're not just talking about providing loans. We're providing, we'll be talking about provide, providing loans given, given the, the legal framework, which will make it all. But first, may, maybe uh, we should focus on the difference between liquidity and solvency. Okay, not just from the theoretical point of view of Beijhardt. You probably all know Beijhardt, who was the editor-in-chief of The Economist during the last half of the 19th century, a time of banking panic. And in fact, uh, uh, Beijhardt had, had a uh, wide experience of, of, the financial, of the London financial market. And at the end of his tenure with The Economist, he wrote a book whose title was uh, Lombard Street, a description of the money market. And this is somewhat the Bible of banking, because it describes the customs of the, of, not just of the London stock market, but of, of the London bankers. And one of the main features of Lombard Street was this famous saying by Beijot, which is that in time of financial crisis, central bank well, the Bank of England, should lend freely to solvent depository institutions 
only against sound collateral and at an interest rate high enough to dissuade those borrowers that are not genuinely in need. Okay? So the idea is that, in fact, Bejart was the inventor of the lender of last resort. And this is the invention of the lender of last resort before Bejart. The point was that when, when the crisis broke in, and if you look at the financial history of the 19th century, crisis was approximately every nine years, okay, between seven and nine years, every business cycle, in fact. So when the crisis broke in, some became ins the bank became illiquid, and if they could not recover money, then they went back bankrupt, because the value of the asset side uh, went lower, and you could not sell because of the panic, and then the, the bank became bankrupt. And the point with, with Bajard is that he was the first one to realize that if the central, if there was not, if there was no lender of last resort, then the whole economy could collapse because of the illiquidity of banks. So, thanks to Bajard, the British Treasury became aware that um, supporting banks in times of, of uh, financial panic was absolutely required in order to have a sound financial service system and in order not to hurt the economy as a whole. But the point is that it should lead to solvent institutions. And, uh, well, it, it's quite easy to, to define what solvency means, uh, you know, when we think of uh, abstract examples. But we'll see that in real world it's a bit more difficult. So if we want to look at an abstract example, We'll try to show the difference between a correctly capitalized bank and a poorly capitalized bank. Okay? So imagine two banks whose uh, total balance sheet is uh, worth 100. 100 what? 100, say 100 billion if you want, but it can be 100 billion bouzouf or whatever. We don't care. The point is simply that uh, on the, the, the asset side of those two banks is the same. They do have 10 reserves, that is the same cash, and they lend 90% of their balance sheet. But the liability side is a bit different because the correctly, the correctly capitalized bank has a capital of 10, while the poorly capitalized bank has a capital of 4. Why they did so, we'll see later. Of course, if I have less capital, means having a higher return on capital. Okay. But we'll see how to compute this later. What happens? Uh, why is this? Uh, Capital, what, what this capital has to do with solvency is simply that, in fact, if imagine now that part of the balance sheet um, loses his value, its value, because for instance, in all case, reserves cannot lose their value because reserves are, of course, in, in central currency, so uh, they are cash, so they cannot lose their value. But imagine that some, some of the loans become non performing loans completely non-performing notes, because the, the, the borrower disappear. Okay? Imagine they are, they are abducted by aliens, for instance, which is not common in, in banking business, but it can happen, you know? so you can provide for this as well. So five units of loans are abducted by the aliens who do not pay, by the way, because we cannot send them you know, the bills for them to pay. <coughs> what does this mean? It means that we should take out five of the asset side of the balance sheet because five of the loans is worth zero, hence the value of the asset is five less. Um, the asset side cannot be worth more than the liability side, of course. So five should be removed from the liability side. And you cannot remove five from the deposits because you know, when the customers come in, come to the bank and say, I want the money back, cannot explain them, I'm sorry, you lost some money to the aliens, so we're not paying back your money. This doesn't work. Of course, this, this would ruin your reputation. No, this doesn't work. So you have to take the money, you have to take the loss from the capital. Okay? That is to say, from the, from the shareholders. So the shareholders, they take the losses. Uh, when we look at the correctly capitalized bank, they have 10 in capital. So their capital is halved, but they still have 5 in capital. When we look at the poorly capitalized bank, they had only four in capital. So if they lose five, their capital is now negative. And of course, you cannot own a negative capital simply because it means 
uh, you cannot pay for all of the deposits. And, and well, this cannot happen. So the bank has to be, uh, uh, the, the bank has to be, to, to be resolute. Okay? You have to perform the resolution of the bank in order to pay the, the, the owners of the deposit before this happens, in fact. So, why, why this looks quite simple on this uh, abstract example, okay, which says that basically uh, solvency means the equity capital of the bank is above zero, or on a wider sense, equity, solvency means you have enough capital, equity capital, to provide for losses on, on the asset side of the balance sheet. So once you have a little idea of the volatility of your asset side, then you know how much capital you must have in order to uh, absorb the losses from, from the asset side. So this is solvency. So this looks quite simple seen from here, but now when you look at a real, real world balance sheet where both assets and where well, assets and liabilities are valued in, you know, in, at market prices, that is to say, in fair value. Market price means volatility. And so if both the asset and liability sides are volatile, then the value of the equity capital is, is far more volatile because it's the difference between both. So while solvency seems a quite simple notion from the point of view of this example, because you know that when your capital becomes negative, then you're no longer solvent. What, what means in real world being solvent? How do regulators measure the balance sheet, uh, the solvency of a given balance sheet, the solvency of a given banking institution? They use magic. No, they don't. No, they don't. So, um, uh, well, in fact, they do use a, a ratio, which is a conventional, which is legal. Okay, so. They, they uh, require the bank to hold a certain amount of capital uh, in comparison with the risk-weighted assets. That's funny because when you think of insurance, for instance, in, in insurance, the capital should be, the required capital should be proportioned not just to the asset side, but also to the liability side of the, of the balance sheet. But as we have seen in the banking business, there is no ambiguity with the, with the, the liability side. The, the amount of deposit is, is, is clear. You cannot tell your, your customers, well, in fact, the amount of deposit that we will bring you, we give you back will be uh, subject to a random trial. This cannot happen. So, so the liability side is perfectly clear. What is not clear is, in fact, how the asset side could, um, could endure uncertainty. And for this reason, the bank should hold some capital in order to pass losses on the asset side, just as we have seen in case of non-performing loans, but this can happen to any other class of asset. Okay. So, um, hence, the, 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 the bank do have a, a solvency ratio, which is, which is defined by the law, or, in, or something which is above the law, because when you think of Basel, Basel II and Basel III, we're not talking exactly about the law, because Basel is, is a Swiss city, and the point is that the Swiss did not make the law in France. Well, last time I have been told about uh, you know, the legal system of France, it is not run by the Swiss. But the point is that agreements were signed uh, in Basel, and these agreements were supposed to be implemented not just in the European Union and in England, but as well as in many countries, in the so-called G20 countries. And as you probably know, the, G the G20 countries are not 20. There are far many more than, than 20 countries. So the, this basal solvency ratio looks more or less like a leverage ratio. Okay? Leverage ratio meaning capital divided by assets. But uh, the assets are risk-weighted. Why do we talk of risk-weighted assets? Before we, we go into risk-weighted assets, maybe we'll see if the ratio for the low capital of the, of the bank number two, okay? Let's have a little look at the measures of profitability. We, we call return on asset, the return on assets, okay, so hence the name. And we, we call return on equity, the profit after tax, that is say, the return, divided by the amount of equity or capital, okay? If we look at the relationship between leverage 
on the one hand, and profitability on the other hand, it is quite clear in our example that the correctly capitalized bank, look, remember, the correctly capitalized bank, they are 10 in capital and 100 in assets. So their leverage was 10 divided by 100, um, was 100 divided by 10. They had a leverage of 10. Okay. Well, if, you, if we look at the other bank, the asset was still 100, but the capital was only 4, hence the leverage was 25. Okay. And now, if we look at the return on equity, well, we, must find, we must give an, an assumption. We cannot compute the return on equity if, if we don't have a, a return. Okay, but just imagine, for instance, that the two banks do have the same investment policy, which brings a 1% return on assets. So as they have 100 worth of assets, they get one as a return. That's quite simple. So the return on equity for the first bank will be, you get one, you have 10 in equity, and so your return on equity is 10%. Okay? Because 1% on 100 of assets will bring you one, divided by 10 in capital, 10% return on equity. While with the poorly capitalized bank, you still get one as return, because of course, um, you have a return on an asset of, of 1% on an asset of, of 100, hence the return is 1. But your capital is now 4, hence the return on equity is 25%. And 25% is quite whooping, believe me, especially if you look at banks now, because no, no bank has that high return on equity. But you understand why the banks are trying to have less equity, because it, it raises the return on equity. And it raises the amount which can be derived from the owning the shares. That's for the shareholders. And for the managers, if they are paid using stock options, for instance, uh, the good point is that the value of shares should rise because the return on equity is very high. So that's it. Um, high bank, well, in fact, if we don't take risk into account, that is to say, that is what we do there. If we don't take risk into account, bank leverage increases profitability. Uh, but on the other hand, the higher the leverage, the less capital you do have, and the less you are able to absorb losses. So here's the problem for the regulator. Okay, that the problem is that every bank has a tendency to cut on capital. But on the other hand, capital is necessary to guarantee, or at least to, to warrant, or at least to support the, the solvency of, of the banks. Uh, therefore, as we, as we said, if, if we adhere, if we stick to the Bayjot doctrine, we must at least be able to uh, distinguish between solvent banks and insolvent banks. Okay? So it is necessary to decide what are those solvent banks. So the way this is... Uh, this is decided under the current uh, banking regulation regime is through that Basel solvency ratio. And that Basel solvency ratio, we have said, is capital divided by risk-weighted assets. By risk-weighted assets, we simply mean that uh, there should be a discount, or on the, on the contrary, uh, some inflation of, of the... The capital which should be, well, I should say it maybe this way. The capital which is owned to, to face uh, asset uh, depreciation or, or, or loss of, of value should be, of course, proportional to the risk of, the, of this asset. That seems quite obvious. Okay? For a very risky asset, we should hold more capital than for an, an asset with no risk at all. And for instance, if, if the bank holds some cash, there should be no, no capital for holding cash, no capital penalty, because cash is completely riskless. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not the case in some, country, but some countries, but usually cash is supposed to be the, the most liquid asset. So for, the, for those reasons, um, the, 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 the Basel uh, framework uh, uh, provides a, a framework for analyzing the risk of uh, bank assets and, and uh, uh, a way to, uh, to recompute 
the value of the balance sheet uh, in order to, to uh, find the appropriate amount of capital which should be owned to face the risk uh, inherent to, to the asset side of the balance sheet. Um, so when we think of this, in fact, the, you know, the Basel balance sheet is somewhat transformed in comparison to, uh, to an accounting balance sheet. Uh, but while in insurance we could say there is a prudential balance sheet, in, in the banking world we don't say there is a prudential balance sheet. Albeit there are uh, transformation of the balance sheet in the Basel framework, we don't... The, 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 there is no Basel balance sheet. We only use the risk-weighted assets as a deflator for the something serious issue. We, do, we never think in terms of uh, balance sheet transformed in, in the Basel analysis. So how do we compute those risk-weighted assets? In fact, there are three approaches in Basel, so we'll, we'll review only, only one, and we'll, uh, I'm talking about the most sophisticated one in, in two words. So the, the simplest uh, approach is in fact um, a grid, well, basically it's a formula. Among the different business lines, there are some coefficients, and those coefficients will tell you how much capital you, you need. That is to say, for instance, if you lend to a triple A state, then zero capital is enough. If you lend to a triple B plus state, then 50% will be the haircut that will be applied to the amount you lend. That is to say, when we compute the risk weighted capital uh, for uh, $100 lends to a state which is rated uh, triple B plus, you don't have to take into account those $100, but 50% of, of the $100. So this is a haircut matrix which says which haircut you must apply to given uh, loans or to loan given to those uh, persons. Okay? So this is, this is the simplest approach because these are simply multipliers. And in fact, well, this is this is the only part of the risk weighted only part of the, the model because in the, in the standard approach there are uh, coefficients such as this for many business lines. For instance, um, if you're providing payment services, international payment services, then the amount of albeit there is almost no asset, it still produces some risks. Hence, you must. Uh, provision some capital, and the, the, the amount of capital which you should, you should have, you should hold, is given by the formula, which is 12% of, uh, of the profits and loss you're doing on this activity, etc. So basically, the standard approach is, is really basic, and it's you know, a series of, of uh, hurricanes that, yet, that you do apply to accounting uh, uh, quantities. But then there is a more advanced approach where you build mathematical models of your own activity and the you have to convince the supervisor that those mathematical models are more rep are representing better your, your risk than, than the standard approach. The main reason to, to build those mathematical models is that of course you could net some risks. Okay? You could, some risk could compensate other risks because, because of diversification. Because if for instance you, you own at the same time the, shares of oil producers and shares of Tesla, it seems quite obvious that when, when uh, the price of oil goes down, uh, this will have a, a bad impact on Tesla, uh, uh, this will have a bad impact on oil producer, but uh, it does not affect Tesla in the same way, etc. So, so the point is that while it's, there, there, there is no co-variation with this standard approach, while the model approach enables uh, a more comprehensive approach of risk taking, and uh, and in the end, it's supposedly uh, uh, finer. But the point is simply that it saves capital for banks. Okay, while it is quite difficult to supervise because those those uh, internal models are huge. But I'm not going into this. And the point is simply to understand that um, Basel provides a grid, which when you use it to value your, your asset side uh, will give you the amount of capital you must own at least to be, to be uh, said solvent. 
If you're more sophisticated, then you, build, you can build your own grid. And that's it. But you have to convince the supervisor. Now, what, what we should do is simply uh, understand how this works. At some point last year, um, there was the idea that uh, lower capital requirements should be uh, uh, applied to greener investments in order to encourage banks to, uh, to invest into, uh, uh, in, into cleaner assets. In fact, this idea was dismissed. It was, uh, there was a big debate, a big controversy back in 2019 about this. And the idea was dismissed simply because, um, you know, capital requirements, hence the way risk-weighted assets are computed, this is supposed not to induce banks to invest into a given class of assets, but it's just supposed to provide the banks with the appropriate capital they require. So if you say, now we will lower the capital requirements for banks who are uh, making good investment, then basically it means that you are lowering the capital requirements. And there's a problem here. So, um, so uh, in fact, th there were supporters to this approach, but eventually it was defeated as, as being uh, awkward. Because if we think of those basal weights as a way to uh, ascertain the solvency, this should not be used to, for, for incentive purpose. Okay. So incentive should be achieved, achieved somewhere, somewhere, uh, somewhere else, or with some other means. Uh, maybe this little uh, exercise, this little practice, will show you how all this works. So for instance, uh, assume that a bank has lent 40 to the government, and the government is rated BBB+, plus, okay? 60 to companies rated uh, a, a triple A, and 42 companies with a lower rating, which is between uh, A plus and A minus. The question is whether the bank has enough capital to face all this, or shall I say, what, what is the capital requirement for, those, for these banks? Okay, so let's compute this simply by adding the haircuts. You know, the haircuts are provided there in parentheses, okay? Because as, as you can see from the, from the previous table, for instance, a state with a triple B plus rating the haircut is 50%. A company with uh, A plus to A minus um, rating here, the, the haircut is 50%, while with the triple A, the haircut is only 20%. So we use these haircuts to compute the capital which is required for the bank. And what happens? For instance, when we look at governments there, we have 40, 40 million or 40 units which were lent and the haircut is 50%. Then 60 with a haircut of 20%. Then 40 with a haircut of 50%. Then in the end, um, the, the capital which is required is, uh, is this. Okay? So since we have 10%, since, oh, sorry, since we have 10 of capital, the, the the, the, the Basel ratio, in this case, is 19%. And 19% is far above the requirement, because as you know, the requirement is 10.5%. And it features uh, not just uh, hard capital like this, but also uh, derivative capital. But as you see there, if, we, if the amount which is lent to uh, poor uh, borrowers increases, then the denominator will increase and the ratio overall will decrease. Okay, so the regulation, the Basel regulation is that the bank should have at least a given percentage. The regulation now is the, 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 that given percentage is 10.5%. So this bank is really well capitalized. That is to say, this bank could lend to more risky uh, borrowers, for instance. Because if the bank lends to more risky borrowers, then the rating of good borrowers decreases then the haircut increases, then the denominator increases, and then the, 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 the overall ratio lowers. Okay? So at some point, for instance, you cannot lend to only um, 
B minus borrowers, because if you do so, then your, capi the, the, your need in capital will be 150%. Okay? So if your, if your capital requirement is 150% multiplied by 100, then you will have 10 divided by 150. This will be only 6%, and so you won't have enough capital. So the more risky your borrowers, or the more risky your assets, more generally, uh, the, the more capital you must have. And with a given with a given amount of capital, you can take some risks. Okay. So now we understand that in order to think that a bank is is solvent, hence. Uh, eligible to, uh, um, to, to the lender of last resort, we use that kind of tool. And basically, that's the way, not just the European Central Bank, which supervises the largest European bank, but also the national competent authority, that is to say the national regulators, compute or uh, uh, decides whether banks are soundly run and hence solvent or not. And of course, if banks are insolvent, well, usually, the regulators should intervene before the bank goes be below that level, of course. Okay? And, and when you think of, of Europe, of the European Union, there have not been much uh, bank uh, insolvency in the last in the last years. Okay? Uh, the only exception was was uh, Monte de Pasquini Siena, but the reason is well, you know, more or less. Uh, uh, the reason why Monte de Pasquini Siena went bankrupt was that. Basically, they bought um, a bank which was overvalued. So they discovered that the goodwill was negative, and this completely consumed their uh, their equity. Okay. But normally, European banks are quite soundly monitored, and hence there is no problem apart from when crisis breaks in. So, um, what do I say when I say that? Uh, Basel II solvency ratios are procyclical, which is a problem because when, when the crisis breaks in, the capital might become not uh, sufficient. Imagine that the economic situation deteriorates and, and that the, the rating declines, the ratings decline by one notch. Okay? So we have said the rating is declined by one notch. It means that while the companies, the companies which were A plus to A minus, they, they become uh, A minus to triple B. They, may, they become triple B. The companies which were triple A, they become A. And uh, the governments that were triple B plus, they, they become, in fact, uh, B or double B. Okay? So the haircut goes up. And so the capital requirement goes up. Shall we make the, the computation? Yes. Because uh, if things go this way, the Haircuts which were 50 become 1, and the haircut which was 20 become uh, 50. Okay, So now the capital requirements are 9%. So, sorry, the, the basal ratio is 9%. That is to say, it's below the threshold which is compulsory by law. So at this point, the bank, because of deteriorating macroeconomic situation which leads to a lowering of rating by rating agencies. Now the bank doesn't hold enough capital to hold those assets. And so that's, that's procyclicity because in fact uh, when, when the cycle goes down, the bank capital goes down as well. The problem is that in fact when the, when the cycle goes down it's exactly the time where you know, non-performing non loans appears, well, basically when, when there are losses on assets, and hence when you need capital in order to face those, loans on, on, those losses on assets. But if at the same time your, your capital ratio drops, you don't have enough capital, you have less capital. Uh, so that's, that's a problem. And the, the, the reason why it's a problem, it's because the, Banks usually, of course, somewhat may be forced into deleveraging their balance sheet. What, what means deleveraging? Simply trying to lower the leverage ratio. Okay? Imagine now 
that the leverage ratio between by, required by the regulators is 4%. Um, I, I'm still thinking of, of, my, okay, of my two banks. And imagine that the poorly capitalized bank has, um, uh, well, it has still 4% of capital, but that's the requirement. I'm not talking about real-world requirements, but requirements in an example just to understand how the leveraging works. So imagine that the, the capital requirement is 4%, and imagine that the bank lose, lose 2% of, of its assets. Okay? What do I mean by it lose 2% of its assets? Simply uh, imagine that because of the crisis, because of, for instance, the housing, there's the housing bubble crashes, exactly just as in the US, so some, some borrowers cannot pay back. So you foreclose the, the houses and you sell them, but you sell them at a discount because as the housing bubble uh, busted, of course, prices of the houses dropped, and hence, plus there are some fees, etc. So you, you lose some money on, on your loans. So, for instance, the value of the loans now is no longer 90, it's 89, 88. That is to say, the loss has to be taken on capital, hence there is only two of capital, while the total value of the balance sheet is 98. So you no longer have 4%. So how should, you, how should you manage to go back to 4%? Well, either you say, I'm not going back to 4%. Okay, so the, you know, the regulator comes in, and then you, you're fired, and the regulator sells you to another, to another company, to another bank. Usually, bank executives do not like that kind of, uh, of resolution. So what should you do? Either you raise capital so that you're back with the, the required amount of capital. In order to achieve this, you must raise all, all, well, two in capital. Or you, you could de deleverage. Um, what, what means deleveraging? It means simply that given the fact you have only two in capital, you wind down, you wind, you wind down your, your asset so that your asset is appropriate to the level of capital you have. But as you have two in capital, what you should do is sell one half of your assets to someone else. In which case, you will be enough capitalized. But doing so, you cannot lose. Of course, you cannot sell those assets at the price which is lower than their market price. Because if you do so, you will lose more capital. If we are talking of the financial crisis, it might be not the, the better moment, the best moment to sell your assets, of course. Okay, so assume, assume you can do it. Assume you can still sell one, one half of your assets. In both cases, bank solvency is restored. Okay, and, and the regulator is, is okay with this. But from the perspective of, of from a macroeconomic perspective, or from the perspective of both systemic risk on the one hand and financing the real economy on the other hand. Of course, when you do this, you're trying to sell the assets and you're in time, in time of, uh, you know, of uh, falling prices of financial assets, if you're, if you're bringing more financial assets to the market, of course, you will pressure prices to, 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 to go down. On the one hand, plus, you're no longer giving, granting loans. Hence, people who need loans. And for instance, some companies might, might be experiencing themselves the downturn they need, they badly need some money to continue their business. And you're saying, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm not lending anymore because I must win down my, my asset size. I'm deleveraging, so go somewhere else. But if all the banks are doing the same, then nobody can, can borrow. That's why I was saying, you know, there is a, an economic function in, in giving credit to the economy. Okay, so the problem with deleveraging is that deleveraging leads to credit crunch and to fire sales. What we mean by fire sales, fire sales make, makes no sense in France because nobody, there, there are no fire sales in France. But there are in the US, and especially in the region, region of, uh, you know, on the Western Coast. Because after those fires, some houses, you know, there are those guys, they, they, don't, they don't have a house anymore, so uh, they, they cannot protect what they own. So what do they do? They, they put everything on the, on the sidewalk and they're asking for a, for a passerby 
buy whatever you want at whatever price, okay? Because because I, I can no longer keep them in my house. The house has been uh, has been has been burned. So the point with fire sale is that you're you're selling at any price, and of course it's not good for you. It's not good for the economy. <laughs> it's good for the guy who who buys from you. That's it. But 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 it's not the way the economy should run. So. Deleveraging from the point of view of bank means well, not good, but from the, from the point of view of the wider economy, is, is a catastrophe. So you understand why, of course. Uh, well, all governments have been trying to provide banks with capitals, with, capi with enough capital, during the last financial crisis. So um, some politicians opposed this bail-in of banks. This bailout of banks, but the point is that if the banks were not bailed out, then the whole economy uh, would have crumbled. But we have the solution. <laughs> uh, that that would be another another course. Okay, so um, so if we think of deleveraging, that's how the the bank should look. Okay, deleveraging means that in our case you sell more than one half of the loans. So you must find someone who is willing to accept them. And it's, it is very improbable that you won't, you won't have some losses on this. So maybe it's time? It's time. Thank you for your attention. Have a nice evening. I'm putting all I can on the website.